So we'll, we'll spend the next bit of time in discussion among the group, and then as advertised, we'll open it up to uh, opportunity for all of you to participate. And uh, all of you should feel free to initiate any of the questions or follow-up you'd like, but well, let me just uh, start. Scott, maybe you can uh, clarify a couple of dimensions for us. You alluded to the fact that the relative importance of genetics, genotype, may be different for the survival to a, a modal age of 80 or so than it is for the exceptional longevity. Do you want to comment on that and to what degree we can quantitate the contribution of genetic versus environmental or non-genetic influences in, in normal median or modal aging versus exceptional aging? Sure, so there have been a number of studies to sort of measure how much is longevity due to good lifestyle and how much due to genetics. Uh, for example, there's a long-lived family study uh, out of the NIA and uh, twin studies. And so it those studies suggest that perhaps about 40 to 50% up to about that level is due to genetics. So a lot of it is due to environment. I mean, of course, if you walk out and get hit by a bus, you're not going to live to 100. But, you know, so, so studying those aspects together, I think, with genetics are both important. And, uh, and just to, to expand on your comments about the complexity of genetics, so the GWAS or genetic linkage studies that have been done looking at a variety of diseases have, with exceptions, uh, identified a large number of genes, each of which has a very small effect on the risk of a complex single pathology. How do you extrapolate that to aging, where you might think the phenotype or the ultimate downstream uh, outcome might be even more complex than it is for any one of the diseases? Does that suggest that the genetics and the manipulable genetics or the targetable genetics of aging are going to be extremely complex? You know, I don't know, and, and so part of the reason we got into this was the excitement over the DAF idea that, you know, perhaps it would, there would be some large effect size variants out there and that, you know, maybe it would only be four or five genes. Of course, I don't believe that anymore, but, um, but on the other hand, the, the GWAS studies that have been done, uh, there have been some issues with those and, uh, you know, some technical issues with some of the early stuff, as well as the fact that it's been a little bit difficult to assemble a sufficient number of centenarians. Um, they occur about one in every 10,000 people. So groups like Near Barzilais in New York, you know, has focused on specific populations um, of Ashkenazis. And, you know, New York has 12, 15 million people. So in a place like that, you might be able to assemble um, enough centenarians to conduct these studies. Um, but it might be sort of a challenge given genetic stratification, you know, trying to identify controls that are matched. Uh, the other thing is that so people have been tempted to go down below 100 and have included people who are, say, 80 or 90 in those studies as well. And I'm just not convinced that, um, you know, that's, that's the right thing to do. I think if we can study people who are nicely matched with controls and also, you know, are over 100, that we're likely to, you know, enrich the most that we can. Uh, now back to the, some of the early issues, um, some of the GWAS studies, you know, were done at a time before GWAS studies were really perfected and some of the controls and, and, and technical uh, issues weren't totally solved in those studies. So I think uh, the jury's a little bit out as to exactly, you know, how many genes are going to be involved and what effect size we're going to have. But as we mentioned earlier, if, if they are like diabetes, you know, we may have to sequence two or 3,000 centenarians to really figure it out. So maybe m moving to the uh, question of implications for any of these advances. So once you've identified a pathway, be it P16, senescence, telomeres, uh, any other genomic clue, these provide potential targets for intervention, even if it's a complex overall pathway. And some would argue the more targets, the better, rather than the more targets, the more problematic. Uh, maybe any of you would care to comment on what you see as the, the realistic status at present for moving towards translation. There are certainly those who are very excited about the opportunity, both in public, private, even regulatory sector. So whoever would like to begin with that conversation. Well, I think that what you're um, alluding to is this, um, this issue of um, there may be single diseases, but then they all add up to a uh, decreasing health span. And so if we can target any one of those, um, it may not have a massive over um, impact on overall uh, lifespan, but you certainly could 
have an inroad into the disease. So certainly the area that we work on in uh, telomeres and, and telomerase, um, pulmonary fibrosis is a deadly disease, um, immune senescence, bone marrow failure. So these are all areas where if we could find a potential way to elongate telomeres, you may actually have a treatment that you know, along the way to understanding uh, lifespan and aging, you can actually benefit people. Um, and so I know a number of people, our lab included, is interested in finding um, pathways where you can uh, take cells, and we could do it in our, in our haploinsufficient mice, treat the mice, and then see if telomeres get longer. We have a few pathways that we're targeting now where we can do that in mice. We can't yet do it in humans. Um, but uh, I, I think that just like we saw um, in the cancer field, where getting down to the molecular mechanisms that underlie cancer, and that was work that went on for the last 30 or 40 years. We are now seeing the benefits of all of these targeted therapies in cancers, and it's revolutionizing cancer therapy. So I think that the same idea about really understanding the pathways that are regulating and being able to target specifically those pathways has a, a, a very good chance of being able to then uh, have an inroad in disease. Yeah, I'd like to say something about this too. So uh, you know, I just tell, I've told other people a story. Uh, you know, as, a, as someone who works on both cancer and aging, you know, I, I sort of work on this process of cellular senescence, which is relevant to both. So I feel like it's one topic, but it often seems, I guess, to other people like two topics. But you know, in doing of 20 years in this field, uh, you know, about every four months, my phone will ring with some venture capitalist saying, "What about this kinase inhibitor for cancer? Or what about this immunotherapy idea for cancer?" And for maybe 19 years of my career, no venture capitalist ever called me about aging. And this was strange. I mean, we were publishing articles in like Nature, and the New York Times was writing it up, and it was just crickets chirping. There was sort of no interest in this. And I asked a lot of people in pharma what, why this was, and it always seemed to be this issue of, you know, aging isn't a disease. How do you get approval for something that you have to test for 30 years if a patent lifespan is 17? And, and I think this business about um, therapy rather than prevention really has started to change things. So the idea that you could give an agent that would lengthen telomeres, that would kill senescent cells, that would do these sorts of things, very provocative, and it, it's provided a lot of vigor to the field. I was at a recent aging meeting. You know, the aging meetings for many years have been, you know, the people who work on flies and worms, and you know, a lot, lot of Hawaiian T-shirts, and you know. But but recently, you know, uh, like Novartis was there. I mean, the guys in the $700 suits were, you know. So it, it's really, really, really an exciting time, I would say. That's great. Let, let, let me ask you about uh, a, a, pers a perspective that. Um, Two perspectives that may be at odds with one another. You mentioned uh, cancer and the, and the great advances of late in cancer, <clears throat> where the tendency has been an increased appreciation of the individuality of each cancer and the need to target each kind of cancer and to type them by perhaps genetic underpinnings. While at the same time, there's a great deal of excitement about the possibility under this rubric geroscience, if you will, that there are, un there are underlying mechanisms of aging that are relevant to many of the age-related diseases and so that by targeting this basic mechanism. One will have an outcome, not just on a single disease, but on many. Uh, so it's personalization versus generalization. Do you want to comment on where, where you think the... Uh, we need the, to know what the mechanism of that general thing was, right? I and mean, you have to start where you actually know the mechanism and you can get at a pathway. The concept that there may be something underlying that is general is an okay concept, but until you can get down to what is that thing, you can't really target it. So how far are we in that process? I, I think we're still at the individual level, and then by, by uh, the, the people that go to aging meetings talking to each other across platforms, different pathways, by that process then coming together, you can then perhaps uncover something that might be more general. Um, but I'm a molecular biologist, so I like to think about things in a mechanistic kind of a way, and that's something I can get my hands on. I mean, I will say that I think that, you know, like the telomere deficiency syndromes, these people are starting to have a number of phenotypes that look like aging. You know, they have cirrhosis and some of them turn gray and they have bone marrow failure and pulmonary fibrosis. And similarly, you know, the, the GWAS linkage of P16 to, you know, cancer made sense, but we were very unexpected. We were surprised by type 2 diabetes and atherosclerosis. And, you know, the, these, but, you know, that's a real finding that's been replicated multiple times now. So I think it's, um, there probably are some common mechanisms that play a role in multiple age-related phenotypes, but I'm sure there are also very characteristic important days related phenotypes that are that are, have almost private mechanisms if you will that are that are somewhat different and figuring this out i think is the real the physiology of aging if you will is really the, the challenge for our field right now yeah i think also if you think about sort of the heterogeneity of cancers and if we apply that model here you know there could be 10 or 15 ways to avoid diseases and live to be 100 
And so one of them might be, for example, the caloric restriction pathway. And if you are naturally born with being heterozygous for you know, that allele that might kind of ratchet back your use of energy, you wouldn't even have to be on a diet your whole life. But if we could mimic that, for example, with a simple compound, and if that accounted for, say, 10% of the people who live a long life and avoid you know, uh, these diseases, that would, you know, I think you have to understand uh, to what extent each pathway contributes to each person. So in terms of some of the more sensational speculation about human aging, uh, there are those who will point to the ex experiments from Cynthia Kenyon and many who have then followed looking at mutations in model organisms which, in which a single mutation is extended lifespan, as you noted, twofold or more, in which complexes of two or three mutations have included increased uh, maximum longevity and life expectancy by six and eightfold. And so why not in humans? goes the sensationalist question. And I don't know if we know enough to say, that's crazy, don't listen. Uh, nor, I think, do, are, are many of us in a position to feel comfortable with thinking it will translate. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you interpret that? I sort of think this is related to the prior question of, you know, is there, uh, you, can admit, you can easily imagine a situation where you could prevent, you know, 90% of aging, uh, but that last 10% would be lethal. <laughs> you know, so we, not knowing how much of aging has sort of got these private mechanisms and how much is shared mechanisms, it's very hard to answer that. So I, I always become uncomfortable when people say, you know, humans are gonna live to 250 very soon or something like that. I, I don't know how we can really make such predictions given our imprecise understanding of the aging process right now. But does it work more easily in worms and flies because they are simpler, they use fewer pathways, so there's less change that is required to substantially increase lifespan? And they're in a very, um, I think in all uh, sort of experimentally housed systems, you can get much more dramatic effects than, you know, caloric restriction, for example, is, you know, works great in mice that extend longevity very significantly, but I'm not sure people, uh, how, you know, if you were to get exposed to influenza every year and you were very, very thin, that, that might not be so good. So I, I'm not certain even how, uh, you know, the findings from experimentally housed model systems really translate to people right away. So caloric restriction is it may be worth a, a little bit more conversation. It's probably the best known um, non-genetic or genomic intervention uh, associated with increased lifespan. There have been some studies recently, certainly needed to be extended, which have indicated that if you take a group of mice of different strains and calorically restrict all of them, some will live longer, which is the, uh, the classic phenotype across a number of species. Others will have little effect and others, in fact, do less well. And, and as you're pointing out, uh, for someone who is overweight, it's probably pretty easy to say caloric restriction might have a positive impact. For someone who is uh, seriously below optimal in terms of energy availability, ability to exercise, so on, there may be the opposite consequence. So uh, I don't know if we have any devotees of caloric restriction here, but it, in itself, while it's pointed to interesting underlying pathways, uh, is although popular in speculative range, uh, still kind of controversial in terms of how one does translate that into human health and, and longevity. Isn't it true that in the, uh, in the um, uh, monkey experiments that there was no benefit? That's so Carlson, what I recall. Carlson, there, there were two studies that done, one in Wisconsin and one in Poolsville, Maryland that was uh, directed by the NIA intramural program. And they similarly, in, in rhesus macaques, uh, limited caloric intake and then looked at outcomes. And the first report came from the Wisconsin group which said there was a significant extension of lifespan as well as health span, a decrease in many age-related diseases. That was quickly followed by the report from the group at Poolsville which said there was no detectable increase in life expectancy, lifespan, although there was similarly a decrease in, in, in aging associated phenotypes. And when they, this, this is a great case, I think, of scientific collaboration. The, the groups spoke together well, uh, published, discussed their outcomes, and all the intent was to have similar reductions in caloric restriction. They used different diets, one more synthetic, the other more natural. And so now, attempting to understand what variable may have made a difference is quite challenging. This study may never be done again. You know, it's, it's a 20-year study that costs tens of millions of dollars. So to think of reproducing it by varying diets in, in a, pre-ordained way is quite challenging, but it emphasizes what looks like a, a simple intervention will just reduce calories. Even the attempt to do it in the same way, different environment, different subtleties and details can have different outcomes. Yeah, I, I, I've noticed that if you're a celebrity or a mediocre physician, you can generate a lot of revenue writing a book to healthy aging. And so I've often thought about doing this myself uh, for, as a revenue stream, 
But then I realized that it would be a very, very short book because it would be kind of don't smoke. I mean, that, that's pretty good. Uh, you know, stay thin, but I can't really say how thin or on what diet. And probably exercise, but again, you know, should you lift weights or run? I, it gets pretty sketchy after that. So it's, you know, the advice we have to give to people today, I think, is still somewhat compromised by our understanding of. So my book's going to be like one page and nobody buy it. Is the, is the book. <laughs> but uh, but I, I think you know the advice we give right now is somewhat somewhat uh, tempered by our understanding again of the physiology. Well, in terms of some aspects of that kind of advice and the way that. Um, External externalities uh, like lifestyle interventions can impact on what we think of as the basic molecular uh, and, and, and genetic mechanisms. Maybe, Carol, you, you can comment, uh, and Alyssa Apples here will be talking later too, about the interesting ways in which, perhaps in an unanticipated sense, uh, identifiable aspects of externality and lifestyle can affect things such as telomerous activity or telomere length. Do you want to? Expand. I mean, I think that'll be covered in another panel, so I don't think we need but, to. But only, only to make the point that we have to be careful not to separate. There are lifestyle interventions, and then there's something we can do to intervene in, in, with telomere length or senescence. They're undoubtedly going to be highly related. And I don't know, in the case of senescence, if there are Oh, yeah, no, it's, uh, there's a, we've, we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out what makes cells senesce in both mice and humans. And we, as I said, there, there are now some tests one can use in humans over and over time. And it, you know, the, the answer is, is somewhat um, uninteresting, but interesting is that, uh, you know, mutagens cause senescence. So if you don't want to have a lot of senescent cells, don't smoke, don't sun, you know, UV light, you know, those sorts of things. So uh, we've yet, despite really hard efforts, have not been able to find any really great uh, external stimuli. We call these gerontogens, you know, like carcinogens promote cancer, gerontogens promote aging. We've yet to identify a potent gerontogen in an animal model that doesn't damage DNA. So, you know, the relationship with DNA, DNA damage and senescence is well established. But I'm sure there are such things. I think we just haven't been able to find the right one yet. But I believe that there are non-DNA damaging molecules that also promote senescence and, and, and promote aging in, in, in mammalian species. And I guess there are uh, aspects of altered um, genome, if by genome one includes uh, epi, epigenome and such variants that are maybe worth just commenting upon too. So we say you're born with a genome and it doesn't change. Uh, actually, Scott, you might comment on retrotransposons uh, as a case in which b bits of DNA may bounce around, so your genome is maybe not forever. And then there are the, the epigenetic changes, which are, uh, in some cases, inheritable changes that result from en environmental, if you will, extra genomic impact on genome that can be inherited. So the notion of environment versus genome and inheritance is kind of complicated. So uh, uh, since we have you here, uh, retrotransposons for real and human aging? So there have been a, a lot of recent studies showing that we, we used to think that retrotransposons were just in model organisms and, you know, of course humans wouldn't have anything like that, but uh, in the last 20 or 30 years that it's become very apparent that these things are in our genomes, they're jumping around a lot, and we used to also think until about five years ago that they only jumped in the germline and that they were shut off throughout adulthood in normal somatic tissues. However, several recent studies have now shown that they jump around like gangbusters in the brain. And we don't really understand why or what they're doing there. But if you live to be 80, 90, 100, you're going to accumulate more of these things. And perhaps you could argue that it's sort of like any other kind of mutagen and that over time, you know, it'll hit the wrong thing and, you know, you're doomed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for, for, for those of us who, who learn w way back in, in, in school that you know, the genome was a relatively well-behaved and stable thing. This is really a, a, a very interesting and provocative uh, extrapolation from it. And similarly, in epigenetics, epigenomics, uh, are there any cases in humans beyond the animal models in which inheritance of acquired epigenetic changes is playing a significant role? I would say probably the most visible paper in this regard was from Michael Clark. He, um, there's been this argument as whether Down syndrome is a progeroid phenotype or not. And, and uh, Michael argued that uh, the extra copy of chromosome 21 misregulates a gene involved in chromatin structure that then leads to excess um, sort of stem cell, stem cell failure with aging because of a, a, a defect in how they regulate the senescence machinery. So there was, um, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting idea that, uh, you know, stem cells uh, do have to seem to have an intrinsic, uh, so certain stem cell populations have an intrinsic failure with aging, and, and that is associated with a change in the chromatin arch architecture, and many people believe that's a causal thing. And so if you misregulated the machinery, one uh, misregulated the machinery that controls stem cell, you know, self renewal, then you could promote aging. It seems like a, a very interesting idea. Experimental support is coming. 
And it's still not clear that there's transgenerational inheritance. There's, you know, what you get in the zygote that grows up into a person, which is what you're talking about. But whether that's actually then transgenerational, I think that's very controversial in both mice and in humans. It's been shown in uh, C. elegans and, and other cases where there are no mechanisms. But I, I, I think that the idea of, of resetting uh, in the embryo is still pretty strong. So the jury is still out, I think. The solid and C. elegans in mammalian species, not so, not so clear. That's the evidence that I certainly have seen. Well, why don't we let you share in the, in the fun and open it up to questions and, and comments from the audience. Can I ask any of the panelists to comment on the work uh, that may suggest that there are genetic factors uh, which influence age of onset in other diseases? In other words, genes that have an, a particular impact on age of onset. I think there are, um, maybe Scott wants to, I, I think that there are uh, strong evidence that there are many genes associated with uh, the onset of classic age-associated age diseases. Uh, you know, Alzheimer's has APOE, atherosclerosis has uh, various things involved in lipid metabolism and P16, cancer has uh, telomerase and, and uh, CDK2A, and, uh, you know, so, so um, but the question is, is, is how many of those contribute to a private pathophysiology related to just that one disease versus a more aging writ large? And uh, I, I believe that, as I said, that there are uh, a few examples now where um, one pathway appears to manifest as different age-associated age diseases. And, and to affect age of onset in direct response to the question. So in the examples you mentioned, APOE and Alzheimer's disease right. associated with a typically earlier onset, the, the anticipation phenomena with telomere, telomere pathologies is very much like that too. I think also with cancer, as I mentioned earlier, the overall mortality from cancer in the average population is about 50%, whereas for centenarians, it's 4%. So they evade getting cancer, or they survive it if they get it. So I guess that could be sort of a late onset idea. You know, that, that just raises the question. People have pointed to different subtypes of longevity. The, uh, the, the survivor, the, the case of people who, who have diseases, many potentially lethal diseases, and one way or another survive them, versus the individuals who go through a long life without apparently succumbing to any of those diseases. Again, the many ways you can succeed or fail to old age is, is sort of uh, highlighted by, by that kind of dichotomy, maybe very different um, underlying uh, pathways uh, in those ways of successfully reaching older age. Uh, we can maybe alternate sides. Great, thank you. This is just uh, fascinating, and it, it's not my area of expertise, so I will apologize in advance for the simplicity of my comments and my question. Um, my first comment is please publish your negative findings. <laughs> They're informative. Um, so, this, um, And then the second comment is, uh, I think the, the need for transdisciplinarity uh, in this field is um, stunning, and I would hope in future uh, panels like this we would not slice and dice, um, and there would be more integration of perspectives on the panels so that we could have some of the conversations that we couldn't have with this one. Um, and then my third is kind of a question. I was once at a, a scientific meeting where they were talking about a breakthrough and being able to grow new teeth. And someone asked the question, it's great that you can grow them, but how do you get them to stop growing <laughs> at the right length? <laughs> and um, that was, I, I remembered that in listening to this conversation where you have this sort of yin and yang of, of it's too long or it's too short. Um, and if we want to come up with ways of changing uh, or, or being able to control the length, how do you get to that optimal length, and, and so I'm just curious about that aspect of your work. Well, I have one uh, comment on your comment, and if you think that this was a disparate panel, aging, biology of aging has come a long way. This is about as integrated uh, a <laughs> viewpoint as I have ever seen on an aging panel. So um, we are, are certainly yeah. coming along uh, that way. There are different pathways that in, in, inter, um, I, interplay. I, I have two comments. So first of all, regarding my negative data, we actually got scooped on our negative results. <laughs> so somebody else published it before us. How frustrating is that? It's all negative. You should have listened to her. You should have listened 
yeah. publish it. So that's the thing, one, uh, thing too. Um, I, I will say, regarding the teeth and how you get to the not grow thing, uh, we did, I, it wasn't totally true, no one ever called me for 20 years about senescence. I actually did get a flurry of phone calls right after we published this thing about P16 and beta cells, and then uh, six months later, Francis Collins identified that as a major susceptibility for type 2 diabetes in people. And so uh, the head of every metabolism group, uh, basically every large pharma company, called me up and said, how do I drug P16? I want to turn P16 off so the beta cells work better, and that seems like a really good diabetes drug. And I said, well, you know, that'd probably work, but you'll get melanoma and pancreatic cancer. <laughs> <laughs> I That's think another point to be made that hasn't been raised too much is that let's say we are successful in getting people to be healthy in 120 or 110, you know, but what happens from there? You know, people aren't going to go forever. Eventually this mortality is going to kick in. And we know from centenarians, for example, that there's one example of a woman who was a practicing physician till 103, was very independent until about 106, but then lived with her daughter until she died, I think it was 113. You know, and at the end, it's just like everything else, you know, and so if we are successful, we have to think about how to deal with that other side of it as well. Uh, Tom Kasky from Baylor College of Medicine. This is for you, Carol. Uh, we know that there is age-related loss of the X chromosome in females and age-related loss of the Y in males. And males have an additional hit, that is we accumulate gonadal uh, mutations, point mutations with age. So my question is, does the telomerase activity or the length of telomeres relate to these two mutational events of loss of chromosomes and point mutations? I mean, I don't think I have a direct answer uh, for that, although um, I was very aware that I was going to use the term genetic anticipation with Tom Kasky in the audience, and I was quite, <laughs> quite scared about that. <laughs> Um, all of the evidence, um, and we've been able to look at this in mice, where you can look at individual chromosomes. So you can look at um, uh, aneuploidy, chromosome loss, chromosome gain, fusions, is that um, there's no evidence that it's chromosome specific. So if we can stain chromosomes and then have the telomere shorten, we haven't seen any evidence. The, um, the telomere is the end of the chromosome, and they all look identical to each other. They're, it's not like chromosome 15 telomere is any different than chromosome 2 telomere. They're all the same equilibrium. So I don't have any um, underlying understanding of what mechanism would do that, but I don't know that it's been studied. Okay, thank you. Phyllis Dennery, Brown University. I, I'm very curious about uh, how you incorporate bioenergetics and the role of the mitochondria in fueling some of these reactions that are important to uh, altering aging, for example. Great question. Uh, it's really complicated. I mean, I think the, um, it is clear that there's mitochondrial dysfunction with aging, and that leads to a dramatic change in the bioenergetics of mitochondria with aging. And the causal role of that is not clear. So there has been a lot of stuff, you know, suggested that that's, for example, the mechanism of causing DNA damage, which may be true or may be true in certain cell types. It's uh, not easy. Um, but I think, uh, you know, this is one of these ideas, uh, these sort of theories of aging that's been around, and it uh, hasn't made a human impact yet perhaps because of our imprecise understanding of the problem or perhaps because it's not right. But it's not obvious what's the problem right now. But, I, you know, th th there was this sort of naive idea, I guess, in retrospect, that, you know, if uh, mitochondria that were aged produce reactive oxygen species, then you could just take antioxidants and that would be a good thing. And that, that really hasn't panned out. And if anything, antioxidants may cause lung cancer, not prevent it. So, you know, th those trials haven't really worked. So I, I think um, I'm sure the mitochondria is very important to aging. Uh, I just don't understand exactly how today. Yeah, uh, Will Carpenter from the University of Maryland School of Medicine. A question more about the epigenetic mechanisms and how much, what are the environmental factors that are being used in the gene environment interactions? The question is coming some because some of our mental disorders are very substantially shortened in lifespan. And we wonder about things in addition to gestational stress, but things like childhood trauma, physical and social trauma. Can you give us a sense of how environmental gene interactions are being formulated in the basic research? Well, I, I think that that's one thing that we kind of 
left off in this uh, discussion. We were kind of focused more on the, on the genetic, but uh, certainly uh, in my own area, we are very aware that it's both uh, the, the genetic mechanism as well as the environmental. Uh, so uh, for instance, uh, in, in telomere shortening, um, those individuals uh, who um, have pulmonary fibrosis uh, because of the short telomeres, the onset will be 20 years earlier if they're smokers. And so um, the damage to the lung, there's an additive effect of the damage uh, to the lung and then the short telomeres causing DNA damage. There's additiveness there. Uh, in addition, uh, there are examples of um, uh, a viral infection uh, that uh, seems to shorten telomeres uh, in the blood, and it's not because it causes them to become shorter, but it, cells die off due to being infected, and then the other cells have to divide more times, and since the short telomeres are caused by more divisions, then they have shorter telomeres. So there are a number, these are just two examples of how the environment is crucially involved um, in, in all of this um, when we think going forward. Angela Diaz, ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. My family seemed to be going the opposite way. My great-great-grandmother died at 116. My great-grandmother, 108, I was already an adult. My grandmother, at 91. My mother, 81, and has all the chronic illness, illnesses. So I'm, maybe to say I'm worried. <laughs> Do you study that type of families with, that type, with those patterns, and what can be done to reverse that trend? <laughs> Exercise, eat well, <laughs> don't smoke. Am I next? Uh, my name is Robert Brent. I'm from Thomas Jefferson University and the DuPont Hospital for Children. It seems like this subject genders a lot of laughter and humor, probably from anxiety and, and the con concern. I remember a few years ago, there was a report from the, one of the uh, committees of the IOM on, on, on alternative medical products. And the summary of that report was that $30 billion is spent by the public on alternative medical products. In that year, the NIH budget was $30 billion. Do you realize that if you could get all that alternative medicine, which much of it, now I'm prejudiced, much of it is wasted, it's wasted money, and uh, into the NIH budget, we could have solved some of the problems that you want to solve. I think that the National Academy of Medicine has to do something about these alternative medical products that do nothing for the patient except take money from their pocketbook. I guess I would only add that this, this is also an area in which uh, research is important to try to add evidence, either positive or negative, to some of these issues. And, and NIH has, uh, over past years, supported uh, a substantial amount of research in this area. As you know, the absence of the kind of regulation that necessarily translates the evidence to change in practice has limited, perhaps, the impact, but uh, it's ta taken very seriously in an area where hopefully we would like evidence to hold sway as it does in, in, in other important uh, clinical areas. Yes? Uh, Dan Drackman, Johns Hopkins. So far, we've heard about the uh, lifespan of within individual species, with one exception, Dr. Sharp was told us about elephants P53 being enormous. How do you explain the different longevities of rats, mice, flies, elephants, chimpanzees? What are the features that distinguish not size, but what else can you, to what else can you attribute the remarkable difference in longevity? Well, I think ultimately genetics is going to be a big part of that. Um, you know, we talked a bit, little bit about the naked mole rat. So if we expand on that for a exactly. second. Exactly. If you start looking at mice who have a lifespan of a few years versus a naked mole rat, also a rodent, 30 years. Yeah. You know, and there have been several very good labs that have looked at that. 
and come up with sort of a shopping list of what you know genes are altered there. And telomerase shows up on the list. Um, but you know we don't fully understand that yet. They also have cancer resistance, so another sort of theme that. But if you think about that, that they, those naked mole rats, 30 years versus three years, I mean, that's, that's tremendous. Mm -hmm. I mean, I will say there's been a, I think the comparative biology of aging is a fascinating topic. And there, there have been some fairly large studies to look at, say, telomere length and telomerase activity across strains of rodents or across strains of mammals, and then similarly, you know, interest in other cancer suppression mechanisms. And, and um, the results are really interesting. They make for fascinating reading, but it's, it's sometimes the systems are a little intractable to, okay, you know, naked mole rats have better uh, function in this, but you really can't knock it out and test it to see if that's the thing that makes them live longer or just an epiphenomena to their longevity. So it's um, uh, an interesting, I think a very informative exercise, um, but at the end of the day, I think we still have to, you know, sort of tinker gene by gene. Thank you. I think we've uh, taken this to just about exactly our appointed hour. If you'd like to take it, take it over. Thank you. Yeah.